So um, you take the, the good with the bad. Uh, I'm Mark Patterson. I'm going to go uh, first, and Danielle Liss will follow me to talk about uh, contracts and affiliate agreements and so forth. Um, I've been an IP lawyer for 31 years. I've been a personal finance blogger. I have two blogs that I've been writing on for, two, for three years. Um, during that period of time, I've learned that there are a lot of myths about among bloggers about intellectual property and what they can do and not do. And so I'm here to bust some of those myths. So let me, let me give, give you three of them. One is that I can, of course, we all use other people's content. A lot of times we'll quote content, I do it. And uh, there's a belief, one, is if I don't see a copyright notice on the content that I want to use, I'm good to go. Or, um, I'm a journal blog, uh, journalist slash blogger, therefore this fair use doctrine protects me. Uh, so any copying I do and put on my site and comment about it, that's legit. Um, and uh, the third myth is, well, as long as I'm giving credit back to the source, I'm legit. The, the, the IP lawyer says wrong, wrong, and wrong. So let's talk about that. Uh, let's talk first about this um, the fair use myth. This, this is essentially what the statute says. Fair use of copyrighted work, criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship. So as bloggers, we all think that we're, that we're journalists, we're teaching, we're providing commentary on the news and other factors. Well, that's not the end of the question. Because the question is, is why are you copying that content? Whether it's a photograph or more particularly text. In other words, if you're going to comment on somebody else's article or opinion, why is it necessary for you to copy their exact words? Generally, commentary means is that there's a way it's being said. For example, if you're reviewing a movie, then you want to play a, a, a section of the movie that specifically makes your point, then that's legitimate. But if you're just copying words because, well, I want to write a 500 word post, I've only got 100 words to say, so I'm going to grab 300 words that some, somebody else wrote, and then I'm going to comment 100 words about it. Well, that is not fair use of copyrighted work. Um, they're also going to look at the purpose of the use. In other words, why is it there? Is it there simply to fill out the post? Is it there to generate um, uh, more s uh, traffic to your site? Or are you just legitimately making a point about that other author's work and have a need to actually copy that author's words or images in order to make that point? The other thing the court would look at would be the effect of the use on the market for the work. For example, if you are um, copying content in order to uh, um, generate more revenue from your site, I want to give you an example. Um, here's an extreme example of the fair use doctrine. Somebody copies my entire article where I, have, I express an opinion about personal finance, and they put it on their site, and at the end they say, can you believe this idiot? I disagree with everything he just wrote. And say, well, I can do that. That's fair use because I'm making a comment here. That's ridiculous. Here is something that happened. Here, here's, a, here's a blogger, a well-known blogger, who does a lot of, of uh, uh, borrowing content from others and commenting on it. And I'll be honest, well, I'm not going to name this blogger, uh, but uh, my opinion is he walk, he, he's very close to the line. A lot of times, sometimes he goes over the line, sometimes he's safe, because of the amount of the content that he's copying in order to make the points. Now, a lot of times people won't complain about it because they figure they're getting a free link back and so forth. But I'm, I, I'm here to educate you about copyright law and not about what's uh, actually going to happen in the real world. Um, okay, the I gave credit myth. Very early in my uh, blogging career, um, I had, this guy was a journalist who actually had a blog, legitimate blog, lots of content on it. Uh, I wrote an article called Eight Baby Boomer Money Stakes You Should Avoid. I, I gave permission to Aaron Dett, that was smart spending, you probably know that blog, to use my article. Well, he decided he was going to use it too. So I didn't take the hard ass lawyer approach. This is what I wrote to him, and I said at the end, please explain. I just asked him to explain why he took my entire article and copied it. And this is what he wrote back. He says, clearly, you are not familiar with the interactive online world of sharing. <laughs> and he said, furthermore, we are not one of your children to bully. I just said, please explain why you copied my article. We do not owe you an explanation. And his, his, his article was, his argument was, I gave you credit back. So then I had to put my lawyer hat on and explain to him, not only am I familiar with the ways of the blogosphere, but I'm also familiar with the laws of copyright and what you are doing um, 
uh, is copyright infringement. And I'm just highlighting some of the words here uh, that make that point. I just say, surely, because this guy was not just a scraper. We all have to know what scrapers are. This guy was a legitimate blogger who thought, because he gave credit to me, that he could copy and republish my entire article. And um, he says, you're just making stuff up now, and don't rattle th around things like copyright infringement when credit has been given. OK. So I have to assume that there are others out there who had this mistaken belief about copyright infringement. And this is one person I had to educate um, very quickly. Copying with credit is not a defense to copyright infringement. Okay, so that was sort of the end of that. He finally took it down, and I had no further problems with him, but he was very angry with me for uh, making the point. Um, he, at the end, he said, we thought your material was of interest and posted it carefully and prominently attributing the source and providing links. Now, some people would say I was crazy for asking him to take it down, but the IP lawyer in me says, I don't have a whole lot of time to write, but I, when I do write, I'd like to have it on my site alone, and that's why I wrote it. All right. Um, let me talk also about this the, quickly the corporate shield. A lot of people feel, well, if I start an LLC or a corporation and, and if I get involved in some infringement activities, uh, if I copy someone's photograph or article, my um, corporate entity or LLC will protect me. Um, first of all, that is not true. For us, one thing that can happen, the corporate veil can be pierced because a lot of people don't treat their LLCs or corporate entities with the necessary degree of formality, and therefore piercing the corporate veil um, is available as a legal remedy. But more important than that is that you are still responsible for your personal conduct. So if you operate your blog, your site as a business, and you are the one controlling your business, and you cause that business to commit copyright infringement, then you personally are a contributory or inducing infringer. And therefore, regardless, of the sanctity of the corporate entity, you can be held personally liable for that conduct. So it, it is not safe to become careless or cavalier about your actions in reproducing content um, simply because you have this corporate entity there um, to uh, protect you. How are we doing on time back then? Right, you got about a minute left. All right, quickly, I want to go to uh, Brandon. One of the things I did before I got here was to, to find out if, if anyone, any of these A-list bloggers, and there are a lot of them here, I'm not one of them, but there are a lot of them here, whether they were doing the things necessary to protect their brand as a trademark. And I did a trademark search real quick. I found one, or I consider the A-list blogger here, who actually uh, registered the trademark, and uh, here she is. Now, she did this herself. I, first of all, I commend her for, do, for doing it. She, didn't, she did it herself, and she didn't do it right. But um, so, but it's better than nothing. And actually, after uh, Ramit Sethi spoke, I went up and asked him. I said, you know, you're probably the biggest brand here. I, I will teach you to be rich, and you don't have it registered. I'm just curious. I'm getting ready to talk about that at 2 o'clock. Why haven't you done that? He just said, procrastination. And then he asked for my card. So maybe I was a business <laughs> out there. So, the fact is, if you are depending on your livelihood from your blog, you have got to protect, it's more than just the domain name, you have got to protect that as a brand. First of all, you should have cleared it before you, you, you adopted that brand, and then you should protect it. My time is up, Danielle's going to speak, and then we'll have 10 minutes at the end for questions. Thank you very much. First, I'm going to warn you, I first like a sailor. I am from New Jersey. We thought our keynote had cursing. Um, I am cursing for a cause. That cause is love drop. Um, so if I accidentally drop an F-bomb, it's $5. Every other curse is $1. Lindsay, will you keep track of my cursing for me? Thank you. I was going to bring a square guard, but honestly, I don't carry cash. Stop getting screwed when you sign contracts with brands. I've been all over the conference uh, circuit this year because about a year ago, a friend sent me a contract and she was like, I'm worried about this provision. I said, I don't know why you're worried about this provision. I'm worried about the first three pages. And that's where this came out of. I've seen some of the most terrific contracts because I'm sure as Mark can verify, as soon as you're the something, 
out of your group of friends, you get all the stuff for that. And once you're the lawyer out of your group of friends, it doesn't matter where you are, people are gonna ask you questions about it. So I get all the questions whenever anybody gets a contract, especially lawyer contracts. Here are the topics for today. Why do bloggers get screwed? How do bloggers get screwed? And how to stop getting screwed? Who do, we, who do bloggers typically sign contracts with? Brands. I've seen so much bullshit in contracts with brands, it is not funny. Ad networks. I have not seen any bullshit in these contracts. Hosting companies. Oh, ad networks, yes, I'm lying. I have seen crazy stuff. I've even seen stuff like, we have a kick-ass lawyer who has reviewed this. That was in the actual content of their contracts. And you know what I'm talking about? Some of you are probably members of it. Hosting companies I haven't seen issues with. Um, and then the employers, independent contractors and agents. Is anybody represented by an agent in here? That's a somewhat new thing on the scene. I know there's one who is working with a lot of mom bloggers. So, why do most bloggers get screwed? They don't read their contracts. Plain and simple, they don't read it. They think it's boilerplate. I've had more people say to me, Danielle, will you review this? And then they send it to me. And then they say back, you know what, don't bother. It's all boilerplate. They've already sent it to me, so they should know that I'm gonna look at it just out of sheer curiosity. And in one of the contracts that was to guest post one post on a blog, they were requiring, requiring her to get a general liability insurance policy for $1 million for a guest post. <laughs> for a tuna company. <laughs> Bullshit. Again, all legalese. I don't need a question. The lawyers know what they're doing. Huh? When I draft contracts, I draft them to protect my clients. I will draft them to protect my clients as much as I can. If that means the other party is gonna give up some of their rights, okay. If it's going to protect my client more, okay. If you'll agree to some crazy stuff, even better. That's why you need to read them to make sure your rights are protected. Biggest thing, I'm going to jeopardize my relationship with this brand if I say something. Too many bloggers are willing to sell themselves out and sell out their rights because they are afraid to lose money. They are afraid to lose ad dollars. They are afraid to lose anything if they say, you know what, I'm not comfortable with this term, I don't want to sign this contract. If more bloggers were comfortable and would say something, I think we would have much more of a negotiation. I don't, when I get a contract for one of my clients, there's always a negotiation process. There's always redlining, we pass things back and forth. It happens all the time. Yet, when bloggers get contracts, whether it's from an employer, whether it's from anybody else, they automatically sign it. I can't afford a lawyer to pay a lawyer to look at this. That's why we're here today. I want you to look at at least the very basic terms. So how do you get screwed? Not taking the time. And whether it's just to know what to look for or just to read it. By accepting insane terms. That person was ready to accept the million dollar general liability contract for the Tuna Company. And by not being an advocate for yourself. These are, I think, the six areas that come up the most when I'm asked. When I do this as a half hour presentation, it tends to be a bit longer and I cover more, but these are the ones that I get the most questions on. I'm not going to read it to you, but this is generally a legalese piece that I've cut and pasted from an agreement. If you want these slides, please email me and I will send them to you. This is what the term will look like. This is how long the contract is for. Um, consideration. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So consideration is essentially how much you're going to be getting paid. And that needs to be clear. The tuna contract was an interesting one because the tuna contract said, we'll pay you, didn't say how much, if maybe we think that you've done the things you were supposed to do. Wasn't clear on what those were either. This tuna contract was a hot mess, okay? Cra 
crazy hot mess. The term, always make sure you know how long you're going to be doing something. And even if it's going to be ongoing, that's fine. Just make sure it says how long it's going to be for. If it's going to be month to month, great. If it's going to be for three months, fine. But if it's going to be for three months and then it may go on afterwards, make sure you know how long that's going to be. Okay, now this is just out of order because here's the consideration translation. So that's awesome. I did a good job with these. And here's the term translation. So again, awesome. Here's my contract equation. When I was in law school, everybody said offer plus acceptance equals contract. I think it's offer and consideration plus acceptance and performance equals contract. So you need to make sure that you have an offer. So they are making an offer to you and there's consideration. Then you need to accept the offer and you need to perform whatever your duties are that should be listed out in the contract. And then you have a real contract. Confidentiality, it's going to be phrased a lot of different ways. This is one of the things that I see to be the most highly litigated. This is not my slide. Seriously, that's not my slide. It says, heck, count that as one of my curses, because I'm not doing a really good job with the cursing. I'm disappointing you. So confidentiality, don't talk about other people's stuff. Plain and simple, just don't do it. Um, I know where the rest of the slides are going, so it's fine. <laughs> I don't know what presentation that was. So for confidentiality, if you do not know if it's confidential, first of all, don't repeat it. Also, if you don't know, ask if something is confidential before you mention a word about it. Non-disparagement, this is a huge, huge, huge one. I know of a website that laid off a number of independent contractors. Those people then went back onto that website and forum, and then they all talk shit about the employer in the middle of the website, in the forum, in their community. You cannot go back and talk shit about your employer when there's a non-disparagement clause in the contract. Mm -mm, no, this is still not going <laughs> That's fine. Okay, we're just gonna go from memory now. It's cool. So, <laughs> non disparagement. Um, non disparagement. I don't even remember what else the other non -compete. example. I'm really jet lagged. Non compete. Non compete, non -compete clauses, thank you. Um, I've seen some really excessive non compete clauses especially recently, and I think it's really hard when you're working in an online world. The non-compete clause that was my favorite recently was you weren't going to work for three years in the same industry for 3,000 miles. Wow. And I think that the same industry that they had defined within the contract term was in any type of social media. So you pretty much couldn't be anywhere in the country working online for three years. That pretty much takes care of everything. I think that with the way social media is evolving, you've got to negotiate those terms. And that's not something you're really going to see with a brand or with an ad network. That's going to be more of when you're doing independent contracting. So I wrap up, but when you're looking at terms like that, negotiate it so that you can do either a shorter length of time, kind of take the mileage out, or yeah, take the mileage out, things along those lines. We have Q&A now, Mark. Five minutes. Five minutes of Q and A. Yes. Yes, Kenneth. What's a typical rate of where the charge for a contract review? Do you recommend clients to pay this for calculation? I think it depends. Um, the question is, what's a typical rate for a contract review? I think it can depend on if you're going to somebody who is solo, if they charge a flat rate per page. I've seen. Rates that will vary from $150 an hour to $350 flat rate for a contract on up to $600 an hour, depending on if you want to go to the biggest, baddest firm in town. How much do you charge? What? <laughs> How much do you charge? My firm tends to be a little bit lower. Um, I'm in Nevada. We can talk about that afterwards. <laughs> <laughs>